So we finished up with um, discussing the, the ideas of the perfect city, okay? Um, and you may recall that right before he got into all of the controversial stuff in book five, he had, Socrates had, said that he wanted to turn to the less perfect constitutions, the other types of cities and the other types of souls. And so now he finally in book eight gets back around to doing that. And while some of this other stuff has been very interesting, I hope you'll agree that this is also quite fascinating um, and that he's got a lot of insights here, not just on how cities can or you know, political communities can devolve and can change, but also how uh, families and generations of individuals can also change. And it gives us some insight. In some ways, Plato starts sounding like a modern psychologist, and it's kind of neat the insights that he has about, especially about people and how they change, okay? But the first type of city in this hierarchy is what we had been talking about. Uh, the aristocratic or kingly city is that perfect republic, okay? And this is the order of decline that he discusses. Now, obviously in real life, cities don't always de decline in this way, but I think he is arguing that this is the most likely, okay? Um, but obviously sometimes they change, they go back and, and uh, back and forth and so forth, okay? For each type of city that he's gonna discuss and how it changes, he also discusses the individual and how that person comes out of a particular family background. So that's kind of neat, okay? Um, and just a point about this not to be missed is that here we see by his discussing all of these changes that take place over time, that his teaching is that nothing lasts forever, nothing lasts forever, and that there's a sort of cycle that cities as well as generations go through, okay? And, and a lot of that depends upon the quality of the people, okay? So it's not about, um, as our, maybe our founders thought, rightly or wrongly, you know, it's not about creating ironclad laws or a system that, that is so perfect that it can't change because in his view, every type of government depends upon the character, the quality of the people in charge, okay? And it's only as good as that, and so of course, people being imperfect, people not uh, always living up to the ideal, are likely to make that change happen, and a lot of times it's not for the best. Um, so, let's take a look at how this all gets started. So the question is, how does that first city, the question is, how does this change, you know, this perfect city? Well, we already know that Socrates has said it's not likely to happen in the first place, right? But if it did happen, if it did exist, the vulnerabilities are the ones that we've already talked about at length, okay? All of the problems associated with imagining people actually um, participating in that kind of thoroughgoing communism, for instance, letting their children go to be raised by other people, okay? Having sex only when the state tells them to and only with the people that the state tells them to, okay? Those are real problems for real people. And so he says most likely that system that they created of breeding that was supposed to keep uh, the very top people uh, in charge and, you know, and, and eliminate uh, any inferior people from the leadership, he says that system's likely to break down, you know, because of human <coughs> nature, maybe, you know, two golden parents produce a silver or bronze child, but they don't want to let that child go. They don't want to have that child exposed. Or they produce a gold child, but they're interested in it and they don't just let it go to be um, you know, raised by the community, so to speak. So, or they decide that they want to have sex with whom they want, okay? And then through these, these corruptions, you might say, there come 
they're coming to being inferior children, okay? Children that are not of the highest quality, okay? And through them, we get non-gold and silver behavior and ideas, okay? They start thinking beyond the parameters of what they're supposed to. And remember, that's injustice. That's injustice right there in Plato's view because justice is each part doing only their part. Okay, so they start to think about something other than what they are to do. And in particular, they start asking that question that Glaucon asked when he first heard about communism and all of the, you know, the strict way these people had to live. Glaucon said, well, why would anybody want to do that? You know, we want, the, we want things. We want, and that's why he didn't like the simple city too, right? So these people who are born have an acquisitive nature they want for their warfare and for their leadership, they want to have the land and the money, okay? They're likely to think, well, I'm putting in more of my time, I'm putting in more of my effort, I'm risking my life in the case of the silver class, okay? And so I should have what I'm fighting for, okay? So civil war breaks out in this situation, the gold and the silver who remain and those who uh, are deviating from the, the right way and they fight with each other and this leads to a compromise of sorts it's not a willing compromise but it's a an adjustment let's say to reality so <clears throat> he says but both the iron and the bronze types pull the constitution towards money making and the acquisition of lands houses gold and silver while both the gold and silver types not being poor, but by nature rich or rich in their souls, lead the constitution towards virtue and the old order. And thus striving and struggling with one another, they compromise on a middle way. They distribute the land and houses as private property, enslave and hold the serfs and servants, uh, those whom they previously guarded, regarded as free friends and providers of upkeep, and occupy themselves with war and with guarding against those whom they've enslaved. Okay. So what's happened here is that they've moved from a perfect city, the Republic, to what he calls a democracy. It's ruled really by the military, with military values. And it's the second best city. Now, it may sound terrible, like he's criticizing, uh, but when you think about it in another way, what he's saying is rule by the military, if the military resembles as he describes, um, is actually probably the, the best practicable regime. Okay? But only if it is as he describes it. And he's thinking that such a military coming out of the background it does will be very spirited and honor loving. Okay, and so when these people go uh, do what they do in battle, they are going to be thinking of honor. Okay, and honor is a fairly high motivation. In his estimation, it's not as high as wisdom, the pursuit of learning and wisdom, but it's second best, which is far superior to many of the other ways of life that he describes next. Okay, so. They compete for honors, and I suppose that means that any wealth and lands that they obtain, they obtain for the sake of honor rather than just for mere greed. Okay? Can you understand the difference? <clears throat> you know, when I was thinking about this this morning, I was thinking of this show that a friend of mine talked me into watching, Downton Abbey. Probably most men in this classroom would have never watched Downton Abbey. Okay, I, I, it seems like one that a lot of guys don't, don't know anything about, but good. Anyway, um, <laughs> I can't remember these people's names, but there's a man that tries to come into this aristocratic family who's a newspaper and media mogul, basically. So he's really rich, but he doesn't come from the aristocracy. And he's kind of crass. And so, you know, the main family, they live in this beautiful mansion, but they have, they have taste. You know, they're very generous. They have a lot of servants. They seem to, you know, deal with them pretty well. He, on the other hand, abuses people. 
he wants to buy a really fancy big mansion, he wants to chock it full of all the stuff that he possibly can, he ends up being rejected anyway. But, um, but to me, it seemed like the difference between the honor-loving type of person and the money-loving type of person. Okay? Um, that family uh, seems to have its, have its mind on honor, as they define it, of course, in that particular society and so forth. And they look down upon those that just love money. It's just kind of crass and vulgar to them that he's a money maker at all because they inherited their money, okay? And that he thinks mainly about money and things. Whereas they think about, you know, military service, um, you know, uh, doing good things in their community, supporting the hospital. Uh, at one point, Downton Abbey becomes a hospital. Uh, so anyway, this type of, of regime is honor loving. Money loving is less, as we'll see. Okay? So if they obtain lands and wealth, it's for the sake of honor and they treat it and use it honorably. Okay? Uh, so now, interestingly, before he finishes, he talks about the similar type of person and how such a person emerges from a, a family that is a family of learning. Okay? And I suppose this is only one way, but I also think probably Plato um, must have had experience with this, either directly himself or, or through friends, and seen that there's this dynamic that can develop within a family where the father is a philosopher, Okay, or in modern parlance, an intellectual. Okay? But the father is not interested in, in uh, making money or in status. Okay? Not interested in status, not in love with honor, just wants to think, be left alone to think and learn and so forth. But his wife is not happy with that because for her, the, the only way that she can gain status in society is through her husband. Okay? And so she's always prodding him and criticizing him and basically saying, you know what, you should, you should stop thinking so much and maybe start working more and <laughs> make some money or you know, run for office, do something like that. Okay? Socrates' own wife, supposedly, according to the lore, uh, did complain to him about this. You know, why are you, you know, we have children and you know, we need to have a nice place to live and so forth and you all just talking to your friends all the time. So she wants him to be more of a man in the, as it is defined by the society, right? So she wants him to, to be, she associates philosophizing with a lack of masculinity because it's not about worldly success. And so his son is watching this, this interplay between the mom and the dad. And he says to himself, I'm not gonna be like my father. He's not enough of a man, okay? I want to be, like my mom wants him to be, okay? It's interesting psychology there, you know, that you know, somehow Plato knew this dynamic develops. You know, little girls fall in love with their fathers and little boys, for a while at least, fall in love with their mothers and want to make them happy and so forth. So this son says, I'm not gonna be like my dad. I'm gonna be a real man, okay? So he becomes ambitious prove himself to his mother and to the world, and he goes into either military service or business, but spiritedness is what prevails in his soul, okay? He's a spirited person, he wants to prove himself. He wants to work to gain status in society, to impress his mother and to impress other people. And again, notice that it may be, in Plato's mind, less than being a philosopher, but again, most people aren't philosophers, so on the other hand, he may be saying, this is the best type of character that most people can obtain, okay? Because look, I mean, such a person works very hard, training himself, learning, okay, but learning to be skilled in the military arts, okay, uh, or maybe in politics, okay? He's learning for a goal, so he's very goal-oriented, right? 
He's not miserly. He's not greedy. Okay. He's not small-minded. Right. So this is a fairly uh, admirable person. All right. Any questions or comments about how we move then from the perfect city to the democracy? Timei is what uh, you may wonder. Well, why is it called democracy instead of military will? Timei means honor. It gets a Greek, you know. So it it means the honor-loving city. Okay, literally. Um, or rule by those who love honor. Okay. All right, so do we have people of that character in our own society, the honor loving? There's some of them, right? I mean, you can, you can point to them. Some of them are in the military, some of them are in leadership, okay? That you can find them in any walk of life. Um, they are motivated by uh, their principles. They value the esteem of other people, okay? Not just to get a, a thrill off of their power, but they value the esteem of other people, the status that they have, which they can then use to do valuable things, okay? So such a city would give the awards and the benefits uh, to those who are the most honorable, who'd proven themselves to be very valuable, uh, defenders of the community, okay, leaders and so forth. All right, so, so the next city that, that comes out of the democracy that is a decline from the democracy is the oligarchy, okay? Oligarchs are wealthy people, okay? So this is ruled by the wealthy. And he says how this happens is that through their conquests, okay, uh, through their, their great ability, military ability, these people in the democracy are going to accumulate more land and more wealth. And while the Timocrat wants to use that land and wealth for honor and for what is good for the community, there's going to be some people for whom that property and that level of wealth is going to corrupt them, okay? And they're going to start thinking, well, I have more, for instance. You know, I have more property than these other people because I've been more successful. And therefore, why do we have the same share of power? Okay. I have more property, and therefore, because I have more talent, okay, and also I contribute more in taxes, perhaps, okay, and I employ more people, and therefore, why shouldn't I have more of a say more of a vote, you might say, in what goes on in this government than the person who doesn't contribute as much. Okay? So some people start making this argument that for higher office, there should be a wealth qualification because it would seem like wealth is a sign of worthiness. Okay? If you've managed to accumulate a lot of wealth, it's because you're very courageous, you're smart, you're talented. Okay? And so why shouldn't it be a qualification for higher office? So they adjust again, and there's another compromise. Because after all, once people become wealthy and, and you get a lot of differences amongst people in, in wealth, um, the wealthy have a lot of power to either spend their money or withhold it, to contribute it or not, and their taxes. The fact that they contribute a, gra a great amount to the community gives them power. Okay? And so he says what happens is you, get, you start to get this rather great divide between the rich and the poor as those who are the most powerful use their political advantage to enrich themselves even more. Okay? And the rich become afraid of the poor and so they become more dictatorial. Okay? because they know that the poor are more, they're m many, okay? Their numbers threaten them, so they need to become more strong, okay? They need to use the laws to control people so that they can keep what they have. Does that make sense? All right. So you get this underclass that starts to develop here, and of course this is, there's more injustice, because now we have, instead of the spiritedness ruling through the military, we have 
the appetites, okay? Um, because those who are rich begin to think about just accumulating more, okay? Um, now, but these people apparently have a still a virtue that Socrates can admire, and that is self-control. Okay? For people to gain in wealth, they have to have self-control. They have to be able to delay gratification. They have to be able to plan and invest and save and so forth. Okay? So they're not <coughs> crass materialists. He doesn't d describe them as just wallowing in their wealth and shoving it in other people's faces. And so, by the way, I would suggest, I don't know how many of you have taken Dr. Frankie's American Political Thought class, but this is where the so-called bourgeois virtues that he talks about comes into, come into play. Um, these are the virtues of Ben Franklin, okay? Um, if you ever look up, if you haven't been exposed to this already, Ben Franklin's 13 virtues, you'll find that there are such things as moderation or temperament, temperance, um, um, sobriety, self-control, frugality, truthfulness, politeness, those qualities that allow you to be successful in business. Okay, those are Ben Franklin's virtues. So Frankie calls them the bourgeois virtues because they're the virtues of the middle class and the upper class. All right, so he also, of course, discusses how the oligarchic type soul develops. Again, that's a soul who loves money in a way, but is not controlled by money. They're hardworking people, okay? Um, they're ambitious. He says that um, the problem that the Timocrat son sees with his father is that his father seems to be on a self-destructive path. He puts, him out, puts himself out there in battle to prove his honor, but he could easily get killed, and sometimes they do. And the, if not that, uh, they lose their property because they're so busy going off to battle, they're taking great risks, right? And sometimes if they're not successful, the war may come their way and destroy their property and take that away. So it seemed like the life which involves a lot of warfare is one of great insecurity. And the sun grows up in this atmosphere and he begins to wonder, why is that a good idea, you know? It seems like a very uh, precarious way to live. We may, we may be wealthy if my dad's successful, or we may lose everything, including him, if he's not successful. Is that any way to live, okay? So he begins to focus in on security. This type of individual reacts to the insecurity by desiring security for himself, okay? So he says to himself, I'm not gonna live like my father and just risk my life. I'm going to build up what I need to be secure and I'm gonna love peace rather than war, okay? Um, and this person, maybe greedy is a little bit too tough of a word here, but he starts thinking about the accumulation of money. And again, he doesn't wallow in all the stuff he can buy. Instead, what's important to him is putting money in the bank, so to speak. Having a lot of money in reserve. Being secure by being backed up by those finances. Okay? His virtue, again, is that he can work very hard. He's self-controlled. He can delay gratification. Okay? He has the virtues that go along with being a good businessman. All right, so he does have this struggle, and it's this struggle between himself, in himself, between his desires and his higher aims, his goals, okay, that lead him to produce the democratic son, okay? But he wins the struggle. In other words, the true oligarchic character is so self-controlled. He may have some desires that don't go along with his goal of security, but he's able to control them. Does that make sense? Okay. There's a lot of people like that. It seems like in our capitalistic uh, system that 
that people do either go one way or the other on this. Either they want to have a lot of things and they're willing to go into debt to do that, and that gets some people into trouble. Or on the other hand, they just like being secure and they'll actually accumulate maybe even more than they really need to in the bank in order to not feel that insecurity. Both of them are kind of pulled by feelings, actually, you know either the fear of being insecure or the desire for feeling good because you have things. Okay. So the oligarch is the one who wants a lot of security and feels much more comfortable if he's got it. Okay. Do, we have, do you know people that are oligarchic souls? Okay. Yeah, maybe some of your parents have some of your parents focus a lot on investing and saving? Okay, I had parents like that. My, my dad was a uh, business teacher. He taught high school students uh, what we would call personal management and business uh, skills, including accounting and things like that, financial management. And as I was growing up, one of the things I did with my dad was I went to the brokerage firm. And uh, he wasn't always good at making choices, but he learned over time. Um, and I learned a lot from him. But, but the reason why he was so focused on investing and saving, we lived in kind of a small house, and he didn't make a lot of money, but he still managed to, to save money, is because he came from the Depression years. You know? He was a kid during the Depression years. And so what was most important to him was always guaranteeing that he had you know, enough to eat, a roof over his head. Uh, and so I kind of inherited a little bit of that from him, okay? But I've tried to walk a more balanced path. But a lot of people from that generation, that was their sole financial goal, security. All right, so now notice this. We've gone down three steps. This is the fourth step down, okay? and we have democracy. Now, keep in mind that for the Greeks, democracy wasn't like what we have, okay? We have a Republican form of government that's mixed and representative, right? But democracy for the Greeks was direct, you know, direct popular rule, which might explain maybe some of the reason it's down this far in his estimation. but. Anyway, what he says is that this comes from oligarchy, and this would, be, this would be directly reflective of his own experience and the Greek experience of this time, because there, there were ideological struggles between the oligarchs and the Democrats. These were two basically political parties in a lot of cities, okay? And there would be revolts in these cities where the Democrats would take over or the oligarchs would take power back, okay? Um, so what he's describing here would be directly within his, his own experience. And um, what he says is that as the rich become richer, not to sound like a broken record, but as the rich become richer and you have a smaller number of them and the wealth concentrates, <coughs> the people become poorer, but their numbers grow and they begin to feel their power. Okay. And so a revolution happens out of desperation because of their poverty. And in the place of the oligarchy, they put a direct popular democracy. So when he says that they rule by lot, this is a radical form of democracy. The Athenian democracy had some offices that were actually selected by lot, but this basically just means more or less people's names are thrown into a bowl and you pick some out and they become your city council or your, you know, whatever. Um, so all the offices in this very radical democracy are by lottery, okay? And um, of course that is maybe, even in our founders' minds, a great recipe for disaster. That's why they didn't establish that type of government. But it, he says this on page 227. He says, uh, I suppose that democracy comes about when the poor are victorious, killing some of their opponents and expelling others, and giving the rest an equal share in ruling under the Constitution, and for the most part, assigning people to positions of rule by lot. 
So now, what's interesting about his commentary on democracy is that, and this would also reflect his own experience, despite the fact that you can see the perils of this, how you know, vulnerable this leaves a city to being misruled, okay, to making poor decisions or to being very volatile in its decision making. On the other hand, he says, the great virtue of this city is freedom. There's freedom, there's equality, okay? And freedom can be a good thing, okay? It's fairly tolerant. As we know, it was tolerant most of the time, but then democracies can switch to complete intolerance, and that, that happened as well, okay? But a lot of the time, it's tolerant because a lot of people just aren't paying attention, okay? They're, they're living their own lives, they're doing their own thing, they don't really care what somebody else is doing, unless, of course, their attention is drawn to that person by the politicians, okay? But people can live in this city and be free to live their lives. He says it's home to many different characters. No single virtue, human virtue is predominant. People are free to live their lives any way they want. So some of them could become almost like holy people. They could live like monks if they wanted to. They can concentrate on making money if they want to. They can become athletes if they want to. You know, they can, they can live however they want. They can also wallow in whatever desires they have and ruin their lives, okay? The choice is completely theirs. Okay? So you find this mosaic of people and uh, there's no common thread. And that type of city is the city in which Socrates lived his life. Okay? And in which, up until the point he became an enemy of the public, he was allowed to pretty much live his life uh, eccentric, eccentrically, <laughs> if that's a word, with eccentricity. Um, and until he got associated with military defeat in the Peloponnesian War by his detractors, People were quite happy to leave Socrates and his friends alone. So he used his freedom to do what he wanted to do. And I think that's why he doesn't just say bad things about democracy. In some ways it's very beautiful. Okay? As far as the democratic type of character, um, he describes that type of person as coming from the oligarchic home. Okay? So imagine a fairly well-to-do family. They've got a lot of money, and they raise their child um, to have whatever he wants because they can afford it, okay? So, you know, what he wants, he gets, and he doesn't really have to work like his father did for it, okay? This is a, a mistake that wealthy people can correct, but, it, but they often don't get it until it's too late. But like Bill Gates, you know, he says his fa his, uh, he doesn't have his kids um, on the computer all the time. They're very restricted <laughs> in their computer use because he knows that they need to learn how to manage their schedule and, and work in their classes and so forth. So if, if a parent is aware that they can spoil or, you know, allow their child to sort of wallow, then um, they, can, they can do something about it. But a lot of times... They just think, well, I've got the money, um, and Johnny wants this, so why not? Okay? The problem with that is it doesn't allow Johnny to develop the self-control that his father had. His father learned how to gain the wealth through, you know, really planning and controlling his desires and saving and investing, right? But Johnny just gets what he wants, so he doesn't have the skills that his father had. Right? And he goes from one source of pleasure to the next. He tries this and he tries that, because he has access to everything. Okay? But again, this leads to a sort of procrastinating, ambivalent character okay? that doesn't have a, a direction, doesn't have firm goals. He doesn't know how to, to stick with a plan. Okay? So it's interesting how Socrates describes this type of person that he says is 
pro uh, prominent um, coming out of oligarchy into democracy. He says <clears throat> on the top of page 232, and so he lives on, yielding day by day to the desire at hand. Sometimes he drinks heavily while listening to the flute. At other times he drinks only water and is on a diet. Sometimes he goes in for physical training. At other times he's idle and neglects everything. And sometimes he even occupies himself with what he takes to be philosophy. He often engages in politics, leaping up from his seat and saying and doing whatever comes into his mind. If he happens to admire soldiers, he's carried in that direction. If money makers in that one. There's neither order nor necessity in his life, but he calls it pleasant, free, and blessedly happy, and he follows it as long as he lives. And his friend Adamanta says, you've described perfectly the life of a man who believes in legal equality. Does that sound familiar, that type of character? I mean, th this type of person has a lot of freedom because he's born into a family that has the money to allow him to pursue whatever's on his mind at the time, okay? And so he doesn't stick with anything. He tries what we would call a variety of lifestyles, okay? So at first he's, you know, uh, um, who am I thinking of? He's Falstaff, you know, gluttonous, drinking, and so forth. And then he decides, well, I've gained a little too much weight. I'll go on a, on a really, you know, ascetic diet. You know, I'll just drink water and eat bread. And that's okay for a while until he gets tired of that. And then he goes and he tries to, uh, you know, he goes to a gym, gets a gym membership, <clears throat> tries that for a couple of months. The rest of the year, <laughs> he doesn't go. So, um, of course, if you don't have enough money, you can't do these things, right? You can't get the gym membership to begin with. Um, but he doesn't have that problem, and he's allowed to do these things. So he, he decides he's going to try religion or philosophy and seek the meaning of life. But then that becomes tiresome. Okay? He decides, well, maybe I'll just go get a job. He works that for a while, but, you know, that gets kind of boring. So <laughs> um, this is what you know, some people do with a great deal of freedom. And I guess what Socrates is trying to point out is that it's very difficult if you live in a democracy, if you have money, it's that much more difficult because you have to have your own, you are your source of self-control. And it's very difficult because you're not raised necessarily with uh, a lot of training in that, okay? And so it's easy for people to sort of wander around and this is why democracy is far from the best type of regime in his view. Because yes, it does allow him and people like him freedom or people in the military freedom to pursue their way of life, but it also allows a lot of other people to just not really pursue any way of life and just to sort of exist. Um, but it has its very good points and its very bad points. And let me see if I can find this great passage where he describes democracy further. Yeah, this is kind of neat. He says, this is on 233, a teacher in such a community is afraid of his students and flatters them while the students despise their teachers or tutors. So you've got this authority issue that starts to develop, okay? Um, and it's out of that authority issue of not really wanting to listen to anybody because after all you are, you are the arbiter of your own destiny that you get the tyrannical type, okay? Um, he says that, and this is kind of a scary thought, but that tyranny comes out of democracies. Okay? And the one example that I can think of that really does demonstrate this is possible would be Weimar Germany, you know, which elected Adolf Hitler um, during a period of time in which people were uh, very, very um, afraid, downtrodden, etc. But nevertheless, they used their vote to vote for somebody they had to know was a racist and an extremist. So he says. Tyranny can come out of democracy 
because of this, this authority problem that develops where the young in particular do not care for the wisdom, the knowledge of their elders. They don't respect institutions. They don't respect anything, okay? Um, and that they're therefore very susceptible to uh, being told that they can do whatever they want and therefore to follow somebody who, who promises to lead them um, to obtain what they desire, whatever they desire. So further, in that same passage that I quoted before, <clears throat> he says, in general, the young imitate their elders uh, and compete with them in word and deed while the old stoop to the level of the young and are full of play and pleasantry, imitating the young for fear of appearing disagreeable and authoritarian. So the, the old lose their authority. Okay. The utmost freedom for the majority is reached in such a city when bought slaves, both male and female, are no less free than those who bought them. And I almost forgot to mention the extent of the legal equality of men and women and of the freedom in the relations between them. Little, little undistasteful there. And what about animals? Are we, with Eschelus, going to say whatever it was that came to our lips just now about them? Certainly, I put it this way. No one who has, hasn't experienced it would believe how much freer domestic animals are in a democratic city than anywhere else. As the proverb says, dogs become like their mistresses, horses and donkeys accustomed to roam free and proudly along the streets, bumping into anyone who doesn't get out of their way, and all the rest are equally full of freedom. So he's describing a, the sort of chaotic uh, atmosphere that can be conducive to the emergence of tyranny kind of funny you should mention animals because it kind of rings a bell, doesn't it? I mean, when did we get to the point where people's dogs and cats are like their children? But we, we got there sometime in the last decade or so. <laughs> I don't know what that means exactly. I'm not saying it means what he thinks it means, but wow, you know? We do that. I mean, some folks will spend more money on their pets than on their children. Pets don't have a lot of insurance. So, but we never thought about the consequences of that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the people uh, are still, the poor are still the largest class in a democracy, he says, and they're still the rich, although they're fewer, much fewer. And so, in this type of cauldron of aimlessness and a lack of authority, lack of respect for authority, somebody rises up, a sort of champion of the people, somebody who says, you know, I will obtain for you what is rightfully yours, okay? Follow me. And they actually uh, do, they actually believe that, okay? And they actually give up their democracy. They freely give it up to this person who, who promises that he'll represent them. Okay? And so it's over because they, they give it up. Okay? This person, as soon as he gets power, turns the tables on the people and using his power and authority, he now uh, treats them as slaves and they fear him. That should sound familiar, yeah. So it can happen. Why it happens, I don't know if anybody can completely explain, but people are quite, um, when, especially when they feel as though they, uh, they're uh, in desperate straits, when they're envious of other people, okay? um, when, when emotions are high, uh, they're very susceptible to being, to, to believing um, charismatic leaders. You know, people who promise everything. Despite the fact that in our experience, people who promise everything never deliver. But that doesn't seem to matter at the moment. All right, so once that happens, that is the worst possible regime, okay? It is basically um, driven by the hunger for power, 
on the part of one and held in place by the fear of the people and now this one person can do whatever he wants and of course we know from other depictions as well as what we're going to talk about next week such a person is completely driven by momentary desires and he's very arbitrary and he takes whatever he wants okay. so then the last question is well what kind of soul you know and how does a tyrannical soul develop what does that look like okay and that's what he deals with at length in book nine okay but we can at least say now that out of the democratic household where the parents have really no particular aim They're, they don't really parent they allow the child to do whatever there's no discipline okay so out of that type of household he says you're likely to get a tyrannical soul okay and that person he will say actually will turn on his parents and take their money and suck them dry and then potentially kill them. So, this is not a pretty picture. This doesn't sound too bad. We're on the precipice here, I feel like, sometimes. Do you think so? <laughs> well, I mean, it does happen sometimes. As a matter of fact, now, you know, usually children don't kill their parents, thank God, but sometimes they do. But, but what happens more frequently in our society and what I hear about every day is children who basically abuse their parents. They never leave the home. They continue to live off of their parents and even in their old age will find ways to take their property from them. I mean that happens frequently. Okay. And you might ask yourself, well, how, why do the parents allow that to happen? Well, he's described the aimless, lacking in motivation, democratic character, right? Such a person can't make up his mind, doesn't really know what he wants, is governed by his feelings. And I don't know how many times I've heard people say, oh, I, you know, but I love my kids. I can't give up on them. My own brother did this with two of his children. Still is. I mean, they're in their 30s. That ain't going to happen to me. <laughs> but it does happen. So that, you know, I mean, we're not used to talking about it in this way. But I remember in graduate school, once we got this language down, we started to see the tyrannical souls around us. And they're, they're more recognizable um, after you read the description. So read the description in book nine, 